Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to uh, welcome you at this third meeting of the parties to the Protocol on Water and Health. I'm really happy to see that so many of you have found your way. The room is filling all the seats you have put up. That's very good. Uh, and I hope this is a sign that uh, the meeting we are uh, beginning now will be a very fruitful and good one, where we will uh, have a look at what has been achieved under the protocol in the uh, last three years, and then we will move forward and see what can be done in the next triennium that is ahead of us. Uh, we have a long agenda today, or rather in these three days. This, this day's, today's agenda is not that long. Uh, but I think we will um, start with the uh, opening speeches. And uh, I'm very happy to say that we have with us Mr. Bent Høye, who is the Minister of Health and Care Services in Norway, who will give us an address. Please, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, uh, Your Excellencies, government officials, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, it's a great honor for me to welcome you on behalf of the Norwegian Minister of Health and Care Services to Oslo and the uh, third session of the meeting of the parties to the protocol on uh, water and uh, health. It's, uh, I'm especially glad to, to welcome you to this meeting room is the meeting room in uh, my party's head office. So I have used uh, several hours of my life in this room. And I hope that you will find it uh, re as refreshing as I had during my life. Uh, access to clean uh, drinking water and uh, appropriate sanitation are basic human needs which concerns all people. It is recognized as a human right by the United Nations General Assembly, and it is one of the Millennium Development Goals. Target 7C of these goals reads, half by 2015, the proportion of the population without sustainable access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation. Globally, many achievements have been made. However, in 2011, 19 million people in the pan-European region still did not have access to improved water sources, and 67 million people lacked access to improved sanitation facilities. More than 13,000 children under the age of 14 dies every year from water-related diarrhea in our region. At the same time, Europe is now the only continent in the world where progress concerning sanitation challenges seems to be slowing down. These facts represent tremendous challenges in terms of burdens of diseases, stress to the healthcare system, as well as terms of poverty and inequality, access to water and sanitation services. I'm therefore convinced that water and sanitation will be an important element of the post-2015 goals as well. In this perspective, the protocol on water and health give us an opportunity. It offers a framework to analyze our national situations and identify, identify our challenges and help us focus the attention of decision makers to action that are needed. In the commitment to act section of the Palma Declaration on Environment and Health from 2010, the protocol is mentioned as a tool where it reads. We will take advantage 
of the approach and the provisions of the protocol on water and health as a rational and progressive tool to develop integrated policies and water resources management and health, addressing the challenges to safe water services posed by cli climate change with clear targets and, and objectives, working in partnership with all concerned sectors. In the aim to provide each child with access to safe water and sanitation in homes, kindergartens, child care centers, schools, health care institutions. Looking at the situation from a Norwegian perspective, our country has numerous raw water resources available. In fact, if we collect all water for drinking water use before it runs into the ocean, we can supply almost the whole world. Most of the sources are lakes and rivers, and generally the water is of good quality. However, challenges still remain. Over water and waste, pipe, waste water pipes are too old and causing le uh, leaking problems. Renewal of pipes is in general far too slow. Some of our smaller public water supply systems are not up to modern hygienic standards and about 10% of the population get their water supply from smaller private system with very little known about the drinking water quality. Climate change is likely to affect the quality of the surface water and subsequently the function of both the water and the sanitation pipe system. This discharges from combined overflow system are likely to increase as water from more heavy rain will enter the sewage systems the discharges from treatment plant is also likely to increase. We need to be prepared for the serious effect of this might cause. The burden of diseases caused by all the, these factors combined is largely unknown and represents in itself a challenge. Norway have, have, has taken active part in the work of the protocol on water and health because we believe it is useful as a tool in addressing national challenges and for international cooperation. The proposal for an action plan with national targets under the protocol on water and health has long been prepared and we hope to see it adopted soon. We want to continue to promote safe drinking water directly from the tap for all people. On the international scene, we have tried to contribute in the different work program areas of the protocol, such as disease reduction, small scale systems, and in facilitating financing options for countries that need assistance in order to establish protocol targets and implementing them. We do this because we see that through participation in the protocol mechanism, there is much to be gained. This conference offers an excellent opportunity to discuss the challenges we have in areas like reducing the burden of water-related diseases, secure equitable access to water and sanitation, improve water management, and establish sustainable international cooperation. Norway will continue to actively support the work of the protocol also in the following years, trusting that this will contribute to achieving the international goals and human rights mentioned. I invite all other countries, parties and non-parties as well, and the NGOs presented to do the same. With joint efforts, we can realize the potential of the protocol on water and health with the, its ambitious yet realistic goals as an effective and practical tool to bridge the gap and the advanced access to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation services. And with this, I wish you the three excellent working days 
here in Oslo. Thank you very much. Now, I think we are proceeding quite fast, and that's good. And this means that we already now can uh, look at the agenda item three, which is where we elect the chairs and the vice chair of the third session of the meeting of parties. This is according to our rules of procedure that we uh, quite early in, in the meeting of parties elect the chair that will be leading us for the next triennium. And um, actually, uh, we are really very lucky because we have a candidate to continue the good work of the protocol for the next three years. It is uh, my proposal that we elect Pierre Studer of Switzerland to be our chair at the rest of this, for the rest of this meeting and to lead the Bureau for the next three years. I take that you agree with this proposal. Many of you know Pierre from uh, previous year. he has, years. He has been with the protocol for many years. He's been the chair of the uh, uh, target setting group uh, for at least six years, I think. So I think he's very well known to all of you. And I know that for certain that he will be a very good chair for the next three years. Please, take your seat. <laughs> And thank you very much for allowing me to be your chair for the uh, three years that has passed. It's been really interesting and rewarding to, to have this position. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kjetil. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to accept this nomination and, and I would like to thank you all distinguished delegates for your trust. I am sincerely honored by your vote of confidence. The immediate future will be very important for the protocol. Indeed, after six years of implementation, a lot of guidance has been developed and several workshops have been organized with the objectives of helping us to better define the way we want to work together under the protocol. For the coming years, we should present in a more consistent manner the significant results of the implementation of our protocol. We already have some good examples from pioneer countries which met their objectives on time and in an exemplary manner. We will work with all parties to the protocol and building on the examples of these pioneers countries. We will strive to ensure that more countries will be able to show improvements in the access to drinking water and sanitation in the future. The protocol is flexible and can be tailored depending on the reality of each country from the European region. It's important to ensure that the main issues are properly identified and that we strive to find the most appropriate solutions. And hopefully these solutions will ideally be in line with the future sustainable development goals. An important strength of the protocol is the holistic approach which brings together a lot of expertise from different fields. This community from various backgrounds can provide very valuable tools to our national governments and thereby enable us to set the right priorities which will lead to substantial improvement in the field of water and health. It has been mentioned several on several occasions that the beauty of the protocol is the fact that experts in health and environment can propose instruments which identify the right challenges. This information is also of utmost importance for the international organizations which are ready to support the implementation and adequate solutions throughout the European region 
for example, the cooperation and development agencies, development banks, NGOs, and so on. Today, I would like to share with you my personal wish. Indeed, I hope that by 2016, we will have some proof to show that the actions undertaken under the protocol have contributed to real improvements in the most remote areas of the countries from the European region. In 2016, I would like to imagine reading news that a small village that is lost in a rural area now has access to drinking water through optimal devices and that improved sanitation is also in place, thanks to the implementation of the protocol. Ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely hope that this will be able to hear such good news with the next reporting exercise. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the government of Norway for hosting this meeting of the parties and for its important leadership role in supporting the activities of the protocol. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our out, outgoing chairperson and my dear friend Kjetil Triton for his leadership and guidance and for having chaired the bureau in such an outstanding manner. I look forward to working with the other members of the bureau, the secretariat and with all of you, dear delegates, in striving to achieve the goals of the protocols. Thank you for your attention. Okay, and now we have to go on with the item three by electing two vice chairs. And for these vice chairs, and in order to ensure the continuum in this protocol, the Bureau proposed to elect uh, Kjetil Tweiten from Norway, the former president, and also Marta Varga from Hungary. Marta, could you please stand up? I guess there are no, no other proposals from the, from the floor. In this case, these two persons are elected, and I wish them also success in sharing, let's say, the, the chair of this, of this bureau and uh, of the working groups under the protocol on water and health. If there are no other issues on the item three, I propose to go on with the item four. And the item four is a special session, special session on equitable access to drinking water and sanitation. And for this special session, I would invite Harsha Ratnavera, who will be the moderator of this session. And with him, for the first part of this high-level session, he will be uh, accompanied by Benoit Vallet, General Director for Health, Ministry of Social Affairs and Health in France, from France, and also two speakers, Mr. Graham Abalaster from the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, and also Mr. Manuel Turnover from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Honorable Ministers, State Secretaries, distinguished uh, delegates. Welcome to this special session on equitable access to drinking water and sanitation, where we will discuss the fair and smart ways to reach universal access. I will be the moderator for this session, which will take about two hours. My name is Harsha Ratnavira, and I'm a professor on water and wastewater engineering at the Norwegian University of uh, uh, Norwegian University of Life Sciences. 
and I have had the honor of assisting the governments of Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan in setting targets according to the protocol and water and health. Already in November 2002, the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights commented that the human right to water is indispensable for leading a life in human dignity. It is a prerequisite for the realization of other human rights. This comment also defined the right to water as the right of everyone to sufficient, safe, acceptable, and physically accessible and affordable water for personal and domestic use. As the director from the WHO, sta WHO stated, on 20th July of 2010, the United Nations General Assembly explicitly recognized the human right to water and sanitation and acknowledged that clean drinking water and sanitation are essential to the realization of all human rights. And as the Minister of Health from Norway reminded, still there are 19 million people in the pan-European area without access to safe drinking water and 67 million people still lack access to uh, improved sanitation facilities, despite the progress which we have seen during the last uh, 10 years or 15 years. And as the director from the UNEC pointed out, there are still a lot of disparities. These figures could be uh, interpreted in different ways. The disparities within and between the countries, between urban and rural areas, as well as between the high and low income groups are even more disturbing. And we know that the poor and the most vulnerable and marginalized groups and rural populations are the most affected in this situation. In this context, the protocol on water and health has a unique role and importance. This is the reason to have this special session with you today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the protocol on water and health provides a sound framework for the translation of the human right to water and sanitation into practice in this pan-European region. It requires that the parties ensure universal and equitable access to water and sanitation within their national targets and capacities and deadlines set. Today, the world economies have great challenges in access to financial resources both the developed and developing countries, or the donors and recipients. So in this situation, we need to be smart and smarter in securing equitable access to water and sanitation. Firstly, the policies need to be smart, smart to favor those areas and population groups that so far have been left aside because it is complex to access them. Secondly, they have to be cost efficient. So, ladies and gentlemen, the objectives of this special session is to discuss the progress made in the pan-European region in advancing universal access to safe drinking water and sanitation, and to assess to what extent those advances have been equitable, and to review what needs to be done to ensure that the common goals of universal access is achieved in a fair and smart way and also to call upon parties, other states, financial institutions, and development agencies for actions and commitments to eliminate disparities in access to safe drinking water and sanitation. This session uh, is organized in uh, three parts. Uh, after the introductory remarks, we will first listen to two keynote speakers on the challenges and the way forward. Then we will invite countries to provide high-level statements. Followed that, we will have a panel discussion where the representatives of governments, NGOs, and international organizations will participate. Hopefully, we will also have some time uh, at the end of this session for questions and comments from the audience uh, before you leave for dinner. With that brief opening statement, let us start this session. 
The human right to water and sanitation requires that these services are available, accessible, safe, acceptable, and affordable for all without discrimination. I would now like to invite Benoit Vallet, uh, General Director for Health, Minister of Social Affairs and Health, the Republic of France, to give introductory remarks to this session. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear Excellencies, dear Minister Representative, um, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here for my first uh, trip as a general director for health in France. Uh, I represent here Madame Marisol Touraine, who was not able to make the, the trip. And uh, I have to apologize for her miss for this uh, meeting. I have also to apologize for the fact that I will not be able to stay very long during this discussion. It would have been a pleasure for me to do so. And uh, also, I'd like to mention the fact that I'm not a specialist on water, although as a medical doctor, I've been involved in how to treat patients and to be very careful about water. I have to say that the view that I have to share with you now is much broader and certainly very interesting for, for the health of people. Also, I apologize for the fact that I will make this speech in French uh, because it's, uh, it's a national uh, policy in France. And so I certainly thank very much the translators for this presentation. So I leave you put the helmets on your ears in, in order to start. Donc une résolution. So, during the World Health Assembly, at its 64th session in May 2011 in Geneva, a resolution was adopted. And in the context of the activities in line with this resolution, but also the Millennium Development Goals that relate to water and the Protocol to Water and Health aims to improve a situation which remains sensitive, this pan-European situation. The protocol's activities, which are our reason for being here today, concern important subjects for our public policies. Systems for water provision, risk assessment and management, warning and assessment systems, and also the notion of equitable access. As for France, and since here we're talking about what France is doing, many activities for equitable access to water and sanitation have been undertaken since the first meeting of the parties to the protocol in Geneva in 2007, and this commitment was renewed during the second meeting of the parties to the protocol, which took place in Bucharest in 2010. And this year, 2010, was the year in which the human right to water and sanitation was recognized by the United Nations. And what was said was that until the right to water and sanitation is fully realized, including in developed countries, where the social costs are significant, many citizens will suffer the health consequences of this marginalization of water and the figure that has been mentioned many times is of a million people in Europe who do not have access to drinking water. What is significant is the concerted efforts that are made collectively, and this collective element is important, to strengthen capacities for intervention sharing of experiences, promoting best practices, and promoting effective policies and strategies. This governance should be global in a world which is undergoing globalization, and water policy, as well as the necessary adoption of legislation, will need to differ from state to state, but they will need to be put together in consultation. In France, significant commitments have been taken 
on the public health front. For example, first of all, through a national plan on non-collectivity sanitation and the National Health Environment Plan for the period 2009 to 2013. And this plan will be renewed for the future with specific activities relating to drinking water. On the social front, and because inequality to access is also related to social networks, France, for nearly 10 years, has been providing access to a solidarity fund for housing, which helps to those people who cannot maintain their access to water for financial reasons. It ensures that they benefit from this housing solidarity fund. And it amounts to several million euros in subsidies. A law published in 2013 stipulates a pilot study to be undertaken for a period of five years to promote access to water and to establish the social tariff setting for water. These pilot studies are undertaken by local authorities, which do so in link with water services and the social security bodies. And in France, water management is both public and private, which gives us many possible ways to approach this subject. This is part of France's efforts to improve access conditions for water and sanitation for all, including in vulnerable urban populations and rural isolated populations. And as you know, in the self-assessment that has been proposed, and which I will mention later, a very specific point is made for isolated populations, both socially and geographically. Access to drinking water and sanitation is a challenge which requires all decision makers and operators with central and other regulation, but because of geographical reasons it should also be local regulation because they can also play a vital role. Henceforth, access to water and sanitation requires the better integrated management of resources and, as you know, increasing competition exists in the various sectors of water use, whether in terms of domestic needs, agriculture, industry, as well as environmental needs. And so a certain prioritization must be done, which will involve regulation and the, the bringing to the responsibilities of the private sector. Various approaches will differ from party to party, but their relevance can be useful to all of us since the broad areas of our work and goals are shared between us, as I said in my introduction. This is a work that we have to do together. I should like to recall here the importance of the publication of the guide, which was produced in March uh, 2012 in Marseille, No One Left Behind. This guide, which is available in three languages, French, Russian and English, is a synthesis document which presents the five key themes around which the self-assessment guide, which I'm going to mention later, has been based, promoting water and sanitation for all under the auspices of the political implications and decision-making processes, whether it's a, uh, an important decision for policy makers, guiding governance towards providing equitable access, guaranteeing access to vulnerable and marginalized groups, keeping water at an affordable price for all, or ensuring that it's free in very marginalized social situations and reducing geographic disparities. As you know, these are the elements that are put forward in this guide, No One Left Behind. In order to know whether these goals can be achieved, we need to put together assessment tools so that we can be sure that decision makers, social actors and water professionals can at a given time come together and discuss what is at stake behind these goals. I therefore have the honor and the pleasure of announcing to you today, which I've mentioned earlier, the publication of a second document and we believe it will be a landmark document and it will be presented during the general debate. This is the self-evaluation tool, the equitable access scorecard. So it is a self-evaluation, self-assessment and support tool which has a scorecard allowing people to assess these systems that I've mentioned, allowing us to know 
in terms of national policies and regional or local organizations whether the organization of equitable access to water and sanitation is indeed present and you will see that these are very pragmatic measurements where it should be of no difficulty to provide an assessment. This tool has already been tested and its operational aspects have been assessed in both Portugal and Ukraine as well as in France in the Paris region and its surrounding area and even if Paris isn't France Nevertheless, it is a significant part of France which represents the diversity of our country, both geographically and socially. So it's an opportunity for me, and on behalf of Madame Marie Souturenne, our Minister of Social Affairs and Health, to very sincerely thank the parties that actively participated in close link with the Joint Secretariat of the Protocol in the working groups that France organized in Paris over the last three years. These have allowed for these achievements. Therefore, on behalf of the French government, I would like to thank the representatives of governments and non-governmental organizations, in particular those of Hungary, Portugal, and Ukraine, as well as MAMA 86, which I now know a lot about, although I didn't before, and I believe that they will all do us the honor of speaking during this panel discussion. France would very much like to continue to focus on activities relating to equitable access to water and sanitation and would certainly hope that for the upcoming 2014 to 2016 period we would be able to share this responsibility with another party. Therefore, we would like to express that wish. So thank you all and I wish you a very good session today and for the coming days ahead. Thank you, Mr. Vallée, uh, for those words and information which is provided. Uh, then we will have the keynote speeches. We are going to have two keynote speech, uh, speeches today. Uh, first, I would like to invite Mr. Graham Alabaster uh, from the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, to address us on the challenges and way forward from a developing and recipient perspective. Mr. Alabaster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, distinguished ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to share with you the thoughts on uh, the achieving the strive to universal access. Uh, as you know, we live in a changing world. Uh, there are many uh, issues relating to access and uh, the fact that we need to understand how the world is changing very carefully uh, in order for us to uh, keep up uh, with the process, uh, very important. I think, of course, most of you know that the uh, current uh, global population growth is growing fastest in the 50 least developed nations. And when we get to 2050, a large proportion of the world will live uh, from the less developed regions we're going to see changes, of course, by uh, the, uh, the social structure. In fact, we have an aging population in many regions. And also by 2050, we will have uh, a large proportion of people uh, who are elderly. Perhaps one of the most significant uh, issues, though, is the fact that the world is urbanizing at a very fast rate and becoming increasingly urban. But what's more important is that the main growth uh, in, in, in urbanization will not be in the megacities, it will be in the smaller urban centres, the large uh, towns and, and the villages <coughs> where not only is there uh, explosive urban growth in some regions, but there's also uh, a lack of capacity to provide basic services. If you look at the, uh, the, the current work that's being done on uh, quantifying this proportion of poor who live in urban areas, we know, for example, that uh, in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, the percentage of very low-income populations is very high. Equivalent figures are given for Asia and Latin America. But in the Euro region, it's very diverse. We don't exactly know. And it may surprise you to know that there are some uh, slum populations in some very developed countries in the Euro region which go unnoticed and below, uh, and below the radar. In addition to the social and demographic changes, we're of course faced with huge uh, 
issues in relation to climate change, particularly extreme climates causing drought on the one hand and flooding on the other. We can expect these to increase uh, in the forthcoming decades. The other issue, which of course is of extreme importance and we're seeing in other parts of the world, is the impact that conflicts, both local and regional conflicts, have on access to ba basic coverage. But in these situations, uh, as is usually the situation, it's the very young and the very old who are the most at risk. But we mustn't uh, forget that the impacts will be felt not just in the poorest countries, but also in the developed world. This slum challenge, uh, to bring it home and to give you a feeling for how many uh, uh, people we're going to see uh, in the next few years, about 38% of the world's urban growth will take place in slums. And it may surprise you to know that the second picture I show uh, on the screen is actually from a, a London suburb, believe it or not. This is a slum within the boundaries of London, which is not radically different from the sort of thing that I'm used to seeing in the developing uh, countries in Africa and Asia. So within Europe, we still have issues in relation to slum. A lot of these are in relation to migration. If you ask the authorities about slums in London, of course they don't exist. So we shouldn't forget that these do exist in many parts of Europe, and the issue is they're below the radar, they're not detected. One of the interesting issues about these secondary towns, and something that's very, very important, is as the urban sprawl grows, we find a low density, peri-urban area which is exceedingly difficult to provide services, to provide pipe services of water and sanitation. This reduction in density pushes up the cost, the per capita cost of services. And the, mean, the understanding is that if we allow this urbanization in the small villages and towns to go ahead unchecked, we will be facing an even bigger problem because of the lack of planning of these urban centers and the sheer escalating cost of uh, a provision of service. So not only are these countries in a difficult situation, the poor countries, they're also going to be further exposed to this issue of uh, uh, challenges in relation to uh, uh, water and sanitation provision. So why has water and sanitation been neglected? The whole status of water and its sanitation as a, as a basic foundation to, for good health has been neglected. If you look in many countries throughout the world, local structures, local public health officers who were in place to monitor and give feedback on the health status of communities, both in rural and urban areas, have had their priorities diverted away to other issues, to other priority diseases and outbreak control. And the, and the health uh, importance of water and sanitation has been neglected. This is why the protocol is so important. It brings back the health, photo, the health focus to water and sanitation. And because of this, the information is, is, is aggregated to a level where the inequalities are masked. So basically what we're seeing is when we look at the uh, overall picture of coverage, as particularly the case in, in some uh, European countries, um, we find that these small pockets, these isolated pockets, are forgotten and these are the places where the health situations are really, uh, really difficult. Of course, the issue of urban and rural in definition is somewhat different because as many of you know, the definition is somewhat technical and it's up to governments to define whether areas are rural or urban and uh, that changes depending on which part of the world that you're in. But the reality is wherever you go, this urban sprawl is one of the biggest uh, challenges to the provision of basic services. So what is it that we can do to address these challenges? First off, to better understand this disaggregated uh, nature of service coverage. And one of the great tools to achieve this uh, is, of course, relying on communities. Uh, and the protocol, as you've just heard, is, is about to launch this very interesting idea on, on report cards, which enables us to have a much better understanding of the, the levels of coverage in these poverty pockets around the world. The second important issue is to understand that, of course, this 
provision must be focused first on the, the poorest uh, in these poverty pockets in urban areas. But secondly, that the, that the poor should also not be denied access to uh, higher quality systems. They shouldn't be denied access to network services for water and sanitation that we all enjoy. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a feeling that, you know, uh, basic sanitation means things like pit latrines and things like this. Most people around the world, in fact, many in the rapidly developing regions are not prepared to accept that as an adequate level of service. So we do have to find ways of, uh, of, of developing basic facilities which can be progressively upgraded to give people uh, a decent level of service. Uh, if that's waterborne sanitation and that works, that's uh, very important. Moving now, the, what implications does this have for the, uh, for the development agenda uh, and the SDGs in the post-2015 period? We know, uh, as we speak, uh, the, uh, the preparations are, are being made for, uh, to support the idea of a water goal uh, in the SDGs. Many governments uh, are supporting this idea. And the challenge here is to effectively combine the different streams of, of water and sanitation together into a holistic goal. Um, and that includes not just the water and sanitation, but also the wastewater management. Uh, wastewater is an area of increasing concern for many of us. And of course, the uh, issue of water resources management. We also know there are opportunities within the health goals to recognize and strengthen the importance of water and sanitation as a cornerstone of health. And um, the other, uh, of course, issue is to ensure that urban development is enhanced and not impeded by the provision of these services. In terms of the Euro region, and again, we have a, a diverse situation that exists here, we know that water, uh, water and wastewater quality will become an increasing, uh, uh, increasingly relevant concern. Uh, there's been a lot of work going on at WHO and other agencies to uh, uh, look at water quality. But we've also uh, are facing in the region lots of issues in relation to toxic and hazardous substances uh, and priority pollutants. And of course, one other thing, which is also of extreme importance, is the, uh, the situations with antimicrobial drug resistance in wastewater. It's not an area that we currently give enough consideration to in our work, but it will become increasingly so over the uh, next uh, few years. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, water quality monitoring will need to be enhanced and we'll need to have much better ideas about the definitions of safe and adequate uh, water. These uh, are somewhat subjective, they need further definitions and uh, it's up to uh, countries to uh, define uh, how they would wish to classify safe and adequate water. There are some critical issues in the region. You, you saw from my, my slides of my hometown in London how we have a situation where there are migrant populations who are living in slum conditions in, 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 in Western European cities that we need to consider uh, for access to services. And of course, my plea for uh, better understanding the idea of the fact that these poverty pockets and small urban areas are masked by inadequate data. We need much more data uh, and we need uh, better data and the, the key to that is, uh, is, is engaging with communities and other actors in the water and sanitation sector. Um, we heard uh, from the uh, previous speaker the role of local authorities have played in, in de developing local plans. This, uh, in my opinion, is a very uh, critical area we need to focus on and something the, the, the protocol can help very, very, very clearly with. So in terms of conclusions, we must uh, give due consideration to the fact that we are living in a changing world and the three major issues that we have to contend with in terms of service provision are urbanization, climate change and uh, in some areas conflict. We need to understand urbanization far better and to understand that actually the way villages and towns in rural areas are changing rapidly, uh, they are developing urban characteristics which we have to be aware of and make provision for. Uh, in the uh, providing services. We have to ensure uh, local authorities and support the profiling of resilience profiling for, uh, for some areas, uh, those that are at risk from extreme climate events. 
And we have to realize that in some regions, uh, there are areas where conflict uh, uh, has resulted. I can give another uh, a good example of outside of the region. For example, where the refugees currently from Syria are putting a, a huge burden uh, on Jordan in terms of provision of services. This is a, a regional issue, and it's something that you know, could, could happen in other areas. So finally, we need better data and information. We need to recognize that the inequalities are often masked in the official statistics. We need to further uh, build on the, uh, the critical understanding uh, amongst people outside of the water uh, and, uh, and health sectors that water and sanitation makes a huge health improvement. And many of the instruments uh, developed uh, under the protocol can greatly assist uh, these challenges in understanding the needs of marginalized communities and how they can best uh, participate in some of the solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Alabaster, for those uh, thoughts and views, which again confirm the how strongly the inequities are masked. There's a lot to be done, a lot can be done, uh, then I will invite Mr. Manuel Thornhofer from the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation to share your views on challenges and the way forward from an industrialized country and from the donor perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I want to address uh, water, drinking water and sanitation challenges from the post-2015 perspective. And I would like to, to look at the post-2015 development agenda applying an inequality lens.